What's up guys, June here, and in this video I want to do a really comprehensive run through of all sorts of different terminology that we use when we're talking about combat in RuneScape. Hopefully this will help bridge the gap between both newer players and people who maybe haven't thought about combat in detail, but also there's going to be tons and tons of info in here, so much so that I'm pretty sure everybody watching will learn something. If you are looking for something in particular though, check out the video description where I've included timestamps to all of the different subject matter. Let's get started by taking a look at three important reference points that help give us some information about combat. The first is the ability description, which you can see just by hovering your mouse over any of the abilities from the ability books. While these aren't 100% correct, they are mostly correct, and they do provide a lot of important information that we'll talk about later on in the video. Next is the loadout screen that you can access through the Heroes tab, and this basically shows you the cumulative total of the effects of your base stats, as well as the armor and weapons you're wearing on things like your accuracy, your ability damage, and your armor rating. These numbers should be self-explanatory, but I will run through them real quick just in case there's any kind of confusion. For the Offensive Stats section, the Main Hand and Offhand tabs only apply to auto attacks. All your abilities pull from the information in the Abilities tab. The first value, Damage, is the number that's being talked about in any ability description where it says, for example, deals 100% of ability damage. Even for some of the wonky ability descriptions that say, for example, deal weapon damage or your active spell damage, this is the number that they're talking about. Your accuracy value here is what's weighed against your opponent's defense, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that's equated later on, but this is what's going to give you your general hit chance against an enemy. The type category indicates to us what very specific style type we're using, such as slashing versus stabbing melee weapons or arrows versus bolts for ranged. This will also come up in our hit chance calculation later on when we talk about affinity and what monster weakness represents. Finally, the speed section is irrelevant in the abilities tab since all weapon styles use abilities at the same rate. However, this is important for your main and offhand in reference to auto attacks because heavier weapons tend to attack more slowly. This part of the layout will tell you what the attack speed on your weapon is. Moving on to defensive stats, the first thing we have here is the prayer bonus. Basically, the higher this value is, the slower your prayer is going to drain. Next up is your total armor. This value is used in the calculation to determine whether or not you're going to block an enemy hit. The higher this value is, the less overall damage you'll be taking on average, but people tend to commonly misunderstand this. If an attack is determined to hit, your total armor value does absolutely nothing to reduce the damage that that attack deals to you. Instead, that's done by the damage reduction, sometimes called damage soaking. We have two separate values for that, one for damage taken from other players and one taken from NPCs. This simply has the effect of reducing the damage we take by that particular percentage. Keep in mind there are lots of ways to reduce damage, such as the Spirit Shield's passive effect that aren't incorporated into this value. Finally, the Style Bonus is going to be either a positive or a negative value that adjusts your armor value up or down depending on what your weaknesses are depending on your opponent's attack style in accordance with the combat triangle. And finally, we have the Buff and Debuff bars, which show a wide variety of different effects that might be applied to your character at any one time. Both you and your opponent will have one of these, and the one for the player is part of the movable interface, so yours might not be in the same spot mine is, but the one for your target will always be underneath the target information window. We'll reference this bar a lot, and we'll talk about some of the specific effects that might show up on this bar later on in the video. So let's start from the really hardcore basics and talk about abilities themselves, which we can group into three primary categories. A basic ability has no adrenaline requirement to use, and it generates 8% adrenaline. A threshold ability requires you to have 50% or more adrenaline already stockpiled to use, and it drains 15% of that adrenaline, though the effect of the Asylum Surgeon's Ring has a chance to prevent that drain from happening. An ultimate ability requires you to have 100% adrenaline, and it drains all 100% of that, though there are some items and effects that reduce that amount, like the Ring of Vigor and the Invigorate Aura. In addition, if you're using an ultimate ability that is a direct damaging ability against the opponent, you have a 25% higher hit chance with that ability than you would with a standard ability against the same opponent, which is one of the reasons why abilities like Onslaught are so powerful. We can further break down attacking abilities into three subgroups. The first of them called single casting or often standard abilities just fire and attack immediately upon activation. These should be relatively self-explanatory and they're likely the ones that you're most acquainted with. You perform an action and you immediately both trigger the attack and incur the damage to the enemy. The next type of ability are damage over time or bleed abilities, and these apply a damage over time effect to the enemy that causes recurring amounts of damage over some period of time. These types of abilities are often labeled as damage over time abilities in the ability description, though this is not always the case. The easiest way to tell this is that an icon for that ability will appear on your enemy's debuff bar after you've used a damage over time ability. There are several really important things to keep in mind when thinking about damage over time abilities. The first and most important by far is that these effects will not stack. If, for example, you and a friend are both using Dismember at the same time on the same opponent, only one of you is going to get the actual effect of your Dismember and the others will be entirely overridden. 
The second concern is that damage over time abilities are often not boosted by the same types of damage boosts that other abilities are. Just for some examples, the Berserk, Sunshine, and Death Swiftness effects do not boost damage over time abilities, however Metamorphosis does. The Invisible Damage bonus from Overloads as well as the use of Prayer doesn't boost damage over time abilities, however the Stat boost effect from the Overloads does improve that damage, as well as effects like the use of Ancient Magics against Muspa or Fire Spells against Ice Strike Worms, those types of boosts do improve damage over time abilities. Even disregarding these boosts, however, these abilities tend to have such a high base damage that you will want to incorporate them into your DPS rotations anyway. The only caveat to this is that you generally want to avoid using bleed abilities while you're under the effect of a damage boosting ultimate like Sunshine or Death Swiftness since they don't get the beneficial damage boost from that. The last category of attacking abilities are called channeled or combo abilities, and these basically charge up over a period of time or they deal several sequential hits. These abilities are often labeled as combo attacks in their ability description, but that's again not always the case. In fact, the easiest way to tell whether or not you're using a channeled ability is that ability's icon will appear on your debuff bar while it's channeling, complete with a timer giving you an idea of how long is remaining and helping set you up to activate your next ability at the right time. This works for all abilities except Smoke Tendrils, which does not appear on your debuff bar despite being a channeled ability. The only important consideration when using a channeled ability is these abilities can be cancelled or interrupted either by you activating another ability, you moving from the spot where you originally used the channeled ability, or by your opponent using a stun or something else to interrupt your action. One other type of ability you might hear people talking about frequently are special attacks, and these are unique attacks that are tied to specific weapons and they have a very very wide range of effects and adrenaline costs. Most special attacks also get a base hit chance bonus, like the bonus to ultimate abilities that I talked about earlier on in the video, though this doesn't seem to be universal and the amount that each individual special attack is boosted by seems to be different. Special attacks are usually pretty underwhelming, but they occasionally carry passive effects that can be very helpful, like the Guthic Staff which has an affinity debuff, we'll talk about affinity a little bit later on in the video, but suffice it to say for now that this special attack can be used to make an entire team of people much more accurate against a particular enemy. Finally, the last means of directly dealing damage to an opponent is something that you'll often hear referred to as auto attacks. These occur automatically anytime you're not using offensive abilities, and on their own they deal relatively weak damage, but they can be used to supplement a normal ability rotation by slipping them in either as you're engaging in combat or while you're doing defensive abilities. Any ability that hasn't fallen into one of our previous classifications doesn't directly attack the enemy and instead is used to impart some sort of a buff or a debuff to either you or your opponent, so let's start our continued look at terminology by talking about buffs and debuffs. In the most general sense, a buff is any kind of a positive effect and a debuff is any kind of a negative effect that can be applied to either the player or an enemy. There's an almost unlimited number of these, between poison, different stat boosts and drains, prayer renewal and other potion effects, as well as ability effects. However, when this is actually being used in combat discussion, there's usually only two possible things that people mean. The first is they're probably talking about the spells in the normal magic spellbook that work explicitly as debuffs with the stated effects of reducing the opponent's chance to hit, the amount of damage they deal, or the amount of damage they take for some length of time. These are very commonly used at high level bosses, so particularly in team encounters, it's common to have one person as the designated debuffer. The other possibility is they may be talking about an affinity debuff, which brings us back to the Guthic Staff special and what affinity even means. To answer that, we have to take a quick look at the combat calculation that's used to produce your hit chance against an enemy. It does involve some math, but luckily this is only about grade school level. In the numerator, we have your accuracy, which is the value from the loadout interface we talked about at the beginning of the video, though there are some additional contributions invisibly from things like prayers. That's being multiplied against the enemy's affinity value, and then being divided by the opponent's defense. In this equation, affinity is going to be some value between 0 and 100% that represents the weaknesses of the enemy to your particular attack style in the calculation. An enemy can also have several different affinity values for different weapon styles being used against them. For example, if an enemy has a listed weakness of thrown weapons, they would have an affinity value of 90 for thrown weapons, 65 for ranged weapons, 55 for magic, and 45 for melee. Generally speaking, the higher the affinity value, the higher your hit chance against your target's going to be, and thus the more damage you'll be able to do given any length of time. The cool thing here is that there are some effects that will increase an enemy's affinity, like the Guthic Staff special attack I talked about earlier, which will increase their affinity by 2 for 1 minute. The Stadius Warhammer is another common choice. The special attack there will increase the opponent's affinity by 5 for 5 minutes. And there are several other common sources, like the Bandos God Book, the Quake ability with two-handed melee, as well as many, many more special attacks. 
All of these effects will stack up to a maximum cap of 5 points being added to Affinity, but the best part of this particular debuff is that because it's applied directly to the enemy, all of your teammates benefit from the increased hit chance as a result. Looking at the Affinity value also helps illustrate the difference between what's probably the most misunderstood part of combat, the difference between accuracy and hit chance. Under any circumstances, a hit chance bonus is going to be stronger than an equivalent accuracy bonus because the accuracy bonus is going to be weakened by being multiplied by that affinity value. This means that items that boost your hit chance directly, like the Reaper Necklace, which caps out at an additional 3% hit chance, are quite a bit more powerful than you'd expect if you're equivocating the idea of accuracy and hit chance, which is very common. Next, let's take a look at some of the more fundamental properties of abilities by looking at their damage output. In some rare cases, like with the ability Slice, the ability description itself is kind enough to give us both the minimum and maximum hit, which makes it quite easy to find the overall average damage from that ability. However, in the vast majority of cases, there's only one value given for the damage of an ability, and there's no clear indication given as to how this relates to the average damage or the damage range. In these cases, the listed damage is the maximum hit, and almost always the minimum hit is one-fifth of that listed maximum. So in this case, 100% ability damage would be our maximum hit, meaning 20% ability damage would be our minimum hit, and 60% ability damage would be our average damage. We can generalize this statement to say that almost all abilities which have only a listed maximum damage have an average damage of three-fifths of that maximum damage. This is convenient because usually the way that we weigh whether an ability is stronger than another ability is in reference to its average damage. There are, however, some exceptions to this rule. A few examples of this are the basic bleed abilities and the slaughter ability for melee. Using the basic abilities as an example, their ability descriptions say they have a damage range of 100 to 188% of ability damage, so if you were to make the assumption that the average damage output was the arithmetic mean, this should lead you to the conclusion that they deal an average of about 144% ability damage. This is, however, not actually the case. They roll for damage very similar to the abilities we just talked about, where the minimum hit is actually one-fifth of the maximum hit, but any value that happens to be less than 100% ability damage is arbitrarily set to 100% ability damage after the fact. This means you'll actually hit the minimum damage of 100% ability damage with these abilities almost half the time, and it weights the average damage much closer to the minimum hit than the maximum hit. The same goes for Slaughter, where the roll is actually anywhere from 50 to 250% of ability damage, and any value under 100% ability damage is arbitrarily set to 100% ability damage. Another exception is the Storm Shards ability, which has a range of 80 to 100% ability damage, which is quite a bit more narrow than the 20 to 100% ability damage, which would be more conventional. This means Storm Shards has a much higher average damage than similar abilities, although you do have to go through the extra step of activating that damage through the use of Shatter. One last example is Shadow Tendrils, which has a really crazy means of calculating its actual damage. Even though Shadow Tendrils is a single hit against the enemy, it's actually the cumulative total of five different damage rolls, each ranging from 33 to 100% of ability damage. The first and second rolls are guaranteed, however the third roll only has a 90% chance of occurring, and if it doesn't occur then roll 4 and 5 are also ignored. If roll 3 is successful, then roll 4 has an 80% chance, and if it fails, then it ignores roll 5, and if roll 4 is successful, then roll 5 has a 70% chance of occurring. When you do all of that calculation, this means that Shadow Tendrils has an average ability damage of about 274%. There are probably many more examples of this, but these are the only ones you should encounter as part of your normal DPS rotations. The next sort of fundamental property of an ability is its cooldown, and this is often confused with something else that's called the global cooldown. In short, an ability's cooldown is the length of time after having used it that you're not allowed to use that ability again. These cooldowns are different for every ability, and they range everywhere from 3 seconds all the way up to 5 minutes. By contrast, the global cooldown occurs any time you activate any ability, and it prevents you from activating any other ability for 3 game ticks. This is the built-in cooldown that prevents you from just spamming out abilities as fast as you can and doing ridiculous amounts of damage in a very short time. Keep in mind this only prevents you from using abilities, this will not block you from moving or using food or anything of that sort. This of course begs the question what a game tick is and how long it is. A game tick is also a length of time, particularly 0.6 seconds, and this length of time represents the rate at which RuneScape refreshes its game information, and is thus the shortest length of time in which any action can actually occur in-game. This means the length of time between activating any two abilities, assuming you're doing it as rapidly as possible, is 1.8 seconds. This in particular will often come up in combat discussions when people are telling you to cancel a channeled ability prematurely by activating a new ability at the end of the global cooldown. From what we just learned, of course, that just means that we're activating another ability as quickly as possible after using that channeled ability. 
Since literally everything in RuneScape is built off this tick system, it can be useful for you in all areas to develop a somewhat intuitive understanding of how it works. In my opinion, one of the easiest things you can do to build your understanding of the tick system's pace is to turn off run mode and just walk around for a few minutes. Each step you take and every game tile you move corresponds to one game tick of time passing, and so this can help build an intuitive understanding and a feel for how that system works. Another phrase you'll sometimes hear used to describe ability effects is area of effect or AoE. This basically refers to any ability that has an effect that attacks a specific area rather than a target itself. Just to take one example, the Quake ability in the two-handed melee book deals damage in a 3x3 area around the person using it. These types of abilities can be extremely powerful because you can use them to target more than one enemy at the same time. Next up, let's talk about Adrenaline Stalling, which is probably one of the most universal combat mechanics that you should be acquainted with. In short, you can force yourself to constantly stay in the combat stance to prevent losing adrenaline by cycling through any abilities that don't directly attack a target. Anytime you see yourself drop out of that combat stance, you can activate any non-attacking ability like Anticipation, Freedom, Preparation, Resonance, Surge, or Escape, or anything like that. This puts you back in the combat stance and resets the timer to 10 seconds, allowing you to maintain that adrenaline indefinitely. You can even do this with threshold abilities like Devotion or Reflect without losing adrenaline as long as you don't have an active target when you activate them. This is very important for bossing, especially at places where there is a respawn time. It allows you to carry your adrenaline over and open the next fight with a damage boosting ultimate, drastically reducing your kill times. Finally, let's just wrap up with a bit of random terminology. DPS, DPM, and DPT just stand for damage per second, minute, and tick respectively, and these are often used interchangeably. Basically speaking, these are the units that we use to talk about damage output in a meaningful way as it pertains to an ability rotation, very similar to the way that you would quantify speed in terms of meters per second, we quantify our damage output by damage per second. Next up are hit caps, which come in two types, hard and soft. The hard cap is almost universal. You can deal up to 10k with normal hits, and this is expanded to 12k for critical hits, and you can hit up to 30k with shatter and onslaught. There are some exceptions where a mob can have a specific hit cap, like Muspa, where their hit cap is 20k, but these are few and far between. By contrast, a soft cap is more of an enemy mechanic that reduces the amount of damage that you're able to deal past some threshold. One example of a soft cap is on the Zeros phase of the next fight, where any damage dealt past 2000 for each individual hit is reduced by 75%. Each of her minions also has a soft cap, which is very obvious. Regardless of whatever ability you choose to use, they tend to only cap out around 1200 damage. In circumstances where these types of effects are in play, you should change your DPS strategy to accommodate for that, by favoring things like damage over time abilities or combo abilities like rapid fire, as opposed to really strong single damage abilities like shadow tendrils. This also begs the question what a critical hit is, and this is mostly a cosmetic effect that indicates that you've hit within 95-100% to of the maximum damage of that ability. Critical hits get a slightly fancier hit splat, and they benefit from the expanded damage cap. Next is something you'll hear in reference to high-level bosses a lot, and this is prayer flicking, which is basically the act of rapidly swapping between multiple prayers, usually a deflect prayer and soul split. This obviously requires a lot of effort, but it can be very beneficial since you do get the full damage reduction of the deflect prayer while you're actually being struck by attacks, but you can heal from the soul split between those attacks. This dramatically cuts down on food consumption and makes you much more effective at any boss that requires you to use a deflect prayer. Next is a pretty widespread phrase, but walking or dragging an enemy means moving the opponent by either moving underneath of them or outside of their attack range, respectively. Walking can also be used as a strategy for a few of the very low-level bosses to prevent them from retaliating at all. If someone suggests to you death dot or dd, they're suggesting that a group of people all stand on top of each other. This term originally came from the PKing community, where it was used to disguise the size of a team on the minimap in the wilderness. Since then, though, it's become pretty widespread terminology, and you'll see it pop up in boss encounters where people are trying to avoid some type of an area avoidance mechanic, like on Yakamaru's shark pool. Another term which can be quite vague is stacks, which is used usually in two contexts in PVM discussion. The first context is probably the Storm Shards ability. Using that ability applies one shard to the enemy, which stack up to a potential 10, which can be activated by the ability Shatter to deal damage to the enemy. The second is any kind of a boss mechanic that can be applied in increments. Using Yakamaru as an example, each attack that he deals increases the amount of damage that you'll receive from all of his attacks, and people generally call these damage stacks. Beastmaster and the pets have similar damage stack mechanics, and Greg has some abilities that gain stacks as he consumes red ghosts. And finally, we'll close the video with what I hope is probably the most self-explanatory of all the terminology we've talked about today, which is off. This gets used in the context of any kind of a boss that has a reflect mechanic, and it just means stop attacking.
Thank you guys as always for watching. If you think there's something I missed, which is certainly possible, there's so many different things to cover, drop it in the comments below and I may revisit this later on, make a second video to cover some terminology that I glossed over. Same goes for any questions, I'm happy to answer as much as I can, so drop them in the comments below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.